As I said last time, I had intended to have this ready for you today, but when I invent these special quizzes, I have the pleasure of thinking about a lot of neat chemistry. Oftentimes, resulting in my thinking about chemistry, which I hadn't thought of before or particular chemistry which I hadn't thought of before from a particular angle. Now I told you about that part of the special quiz <clears throat> which involves thermodynamic property information, silver oxide, silver phosphate, that's that part of the quiz is done. But uh, from our last exam, I believe there was a, let me see, there was a bond angle question, I believe, for this stuff. Mm. Or, was one of these two. I think it was that one. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> so I'll ask. For the simplest known tetrahedral molecule, methane, perfectly tetrahedral. What's the sum of the bond angles? Have to be. Well, what's an individual perfect tetrahedral bond angle? Remember 109.5? If you take a little bit more detail, it's 109.45. So what's the sum of the bond angles for this perfectly tetrahedral? What is it? 430. 430? How'd you get that? Well, I think you better refine your arithmetic a little bit. 438. But you got the idea. Okay? Now I could ask the same sort of question for a molecule which is perfectly octahedral. But these molecules are not perfectly octahedral. Are these molecules, either of them, perfectly octahedral? No. But, oops, tetrahedral, pardon me. Okay, not octahedral. Are these molecules perfectly tetrahedral? No. What will be the sum of the bond angles? Will it be 438? Won't be. Well, if it's not 438, it's either bigger or smaller than 438. Nothing fancy about that. So take note that one of the questions I will raise by special quiz number two is this issue. You'll have plenty of time to think about it. Make models, whatever you want to do. Now then, back to fundamental thermodynamics with our intention at this point being establishing a relationship between thermodynamic properties for a reaction system and equilibrium, <coughs> which we will do ultimately by seeing how change in standard free energy for a reaction system relates to the value for the equilibrium constant for the reaction system. But first, as always, we want to look at this conceptually before we start doing arithmetic. 
So, I said, imagine we do an experiment where we have one mole of pure N2O4 gas in a piston cylinder apparatus at 25 centigrade and external pressure one atmosphere. We recognize the volume inside this cylinder, if we were able to do this experiment, would be initially about 25 liters, be a little less. And alongside it will stand a neck, another piston cylinder apparatus, which we shall imagine to contain initially two moles of pure NO2 gas at 298K, one atmosphere external pressure. And if both gases show behavior describable by PV equals NRT, which is pretty good for these gases, then the volume inside the NO2 containing cylinder will be twice that initially of the N2O4 containing cylinder. And then we recognize that for the reaction, two moles NO2 gas at 298K1 atmosphere becoming one mole N2O4 gas, the change in standard free energy is minus 4.7 kilojoules. That tells us at one atmosphere external pressure and 298K that one mole N2O4 gas is more stable thermodynamically than two moles of N2O4 gas. That's why the conversion of two moles N2O4 of NO2 gas to the one mole of N2O4 gas is associated with a favorable change in free energy minus which dictates spontaneous, 4.7 kilojoules. So with that we said, if we're able to do this experiment, after allowing each piston cylinder gadget to stand for a good long time and then prying them open to examine composition, what would we find? And what we find really, if you think about it, is nothing which should surprise us at all whatsoever. We'll find an equilibrium mix of NO2 and N2O4 gas. Because equilibrium is the most stable state in which any reaction system can exist. So in the cylinder imagined to originally contain only N2O4 gas, there'll be some decomposition in the NO2 gas. And this, in the cylinder imagined to contain initially two moles of NO2 gas, there'll be reaction of NO2 molecules with each other to make N2O4 gas. But will all the NO2 molecules combine and turn entirely into N2O4 gas? No. Even though that's a thermodynamically favorable change. Because to react and become the equilibrium mixture is more thermodynamically favorable than reacting to become exclusively N2O4 gas. And since gases are dynamic forms of material, at 298K1 atmosphere, can I get pure N2O4 gas and keep it as such? Can I get pure NO2 gas and keep it as such? No. So if I tell you the brown stuff in here is NO2 gas, then immediately you can recognize that in addition to the NO2 gas in this sealed small flask, there's got to be also N2O4 gas. Of course, its presence is not detectable by eyeball observation because it is a colorless gas. So, with that having been said, let's look at this consideration graphically. So we're looking at a G-state graph, which you see in the notes. I forget the page in chapter 21, someplace. 21, 8, yeah, okay, page 21, 8. Now we cannot measure the G state of a sample of material, but we can talk about it. Just like you can't measure the absolute H of a sample of material, but you can talk about it. 
the only absolute thermodynamic property you can measure for a pure substance is its entropy. So, on having recognized that the one mole of N2O4 gas is more stable than the two moles of NO2 gas at the conditions external pressure one atmosphere and temperature 298K, we can immediately, in constructing this graph, recognize that the G state for the N2O4 gas is lower than the two moles of NO2 gas. Because the lower is your G state, the more stable you are. Lower is your so-called energy content. So, if I make this horizontal line to correspond to one mole of N2O4 gas G state, and this horizontal line to cor correspond to the G state of two moles of NO2 gas, then by extrapolating this line horizontally over till it, to, till it meets this vertical axis, the difference in these two G states is delta G zero for the reaction. Which, if you go this way, is minus 4.7 kilojoules. If you go this way, it's plus 4.7 kilojoules. But, for the experiment which we talked about, and now I realize you can't do it, but if you could do it, what would happen if we started with one mole of N2O4 gas pure? Well, let's arbitrarily and capriciously define a G state for the equilibrium mix because this stuff became the equilibrium mix just like this stuff. So the G state of this equilibrium mix is lower than the G state of either of these system components or any mix of these system components beside the equilibrium mix. So if I start with one mole of N2O4 gas and I observe that to get me to equilibrium, on the order of, I think it's about 20% or something like that, of the N2O4 gas dissociates. So if this horizontal axis measures percent N2O4 dissociated, at about 20% dissociation will be about here. And so if I start with the one mole of N2O4 gas, it does this. And now it's at the equilibrium state. So that's where it stops. And if I start with the two moles of NO2 gas, I don't get 4.7 kilojoules liberated. I get more than that. Because the two moles of NO2 gas reacts just like the mole of N2O4 gas to become the equilibrium mix. So here is delta G zero, but here is delta G for the reaction. Here's what happened. See? That's bigger than this. And that's what's going to happen. Just like here. Here's what I get. The G state comes down. G state comes down. Oh, I already drew that. <laughs> Who cares? Interesting. So this really is a graphic method of showing you something we've stated throughout. That equilibrium is the most stable thermodynamic state in which a reaction system can exist. So without any kinetic considerations to stand in our way, each and every reaction system at a given set of conditions will always react from a thermodynamic standpoint to become the equilibrium state. Because it's the most stable. So, this shows you how enthalpy and entropy are real properties of material. Because if I look at this reaction, and I remember that total entropy for a system depends on phase, depends on moles. Here I got two moles. Both gases, but here I got two moles, here I only got one mole. And clearly this is bond making exclusively. So is the total entropy for two moles of NO2 gas at 298K1 atmosphere greater or smaller than the entropy of N2O4 gas one mole? This has got to be greater. Aha! 
But there's another part to this thermodynamic puzzle, isn't there? The bond forming part, the H part. Because here, I've obviously improved bonds going from two moles of stuff to one mole of stuff. Again, this is strictly bond making, this is strictly exothermic. So for this, H is a more important property of the system than for the two moles of NO2. But maybe I shouldn't write the H's like this because I want to ask you a question. Which is the more stable stuff from a bond strength standpoint? The stuff with the lower H or the higher H? Lower H. Lower H. So I guess if I'm going to make these symbols that correspond to what's real, I should do it like this. Weaker bonds, higher H. Lower H, more stable. So I like to tell the story that if the only thermodynamic property of material which existed in nature was enthalpy, and the Big Bang is the way by which the universe began, the Big Bang would have never happened. Whatever material was here originally, if there was such, would remain as such. One big glob of material with the strongest possible bonds and no motion whatsoever. No gas phase, no liquid phase, no dynamic character whatsoever. There's this motionless lump and enthalpy as happy as can be. Bonds are at their maximum. But along comes entropy and says, I don't like you. I like wiggling. I like moving around. So if entropy had its way, there never would have been a Big Bang because there would be nothing in the universe except unbound gas phase particles zipping around at infinite speeds. No bonds whatsoever. So I think it's a fair statement to say that the upshot of this is to show us that entropy and enthalpy are in fact real problem properties of a system. Because when we get this pairing off of enthalpy with entropy, we get the most stable state for the system. Because what we've got here is a maximization of enthalpy fighting against entropy. Because if entropy controls the system exclusively, you'll only have this. And if enthalpy con controls the system exclusively, you'll only have this. But they're in opposition to each other for this system. And they oppose each other until for this system you get the lowest possible value for G. That's this. And now the system is thermodynamically as stable as it can possibly be under the conditions at which the system is being observed. Now let's be more practical about this. Oh, by the way, let me comment one more thing about this graph. After we go through section 21.3, which we now start, where we will now show how del G for a reaction and del G zero for a reaction relate to the equilibrium constant for the reaction. So we'll relate this to equilibrium. We'll show how we can calculate this and prove that this thing is at equilibrium when about 20% of the N204 is dissociated. The intention will be really to show you all the chemistry that is contained within this thermodynamic property data table. Table 1 at the end of chapter, pardon me, 20. Now then, We already know how the standard state is defined, but as we mentioned the other day, the third law of thermodynamics has no meaning when you deal with solutions, because solutions cannot exist at temperatures approaching absolute zero. In fact, you're not going to get anywhere close to absolute zero, and a solution, if it's water solvent, is going to destroy, be destroyed. 
because the solvent will crystallize. And when the solvent crystallizes, the solute comes out of solution, as illustrated by our mentioning of the fact that a popsicle is a suspension, a suspension of flavored particles in a lattice of ice. So we got to make a thermodynamic reference point so we can do thermodynamic studies on solutions. And here is the ref reference point. A solution at a pH of exactly 0 0.0000 forever. Which corresponds to H plus AQ. Whatever H plus AQ is. Forming this solution at a pH of 0 0.0000, del H sub F super 0, del S sub F super 0, del G sub F super 0, 298K are defined as 0. Now we got a reference point. So what does this correspond to? Or this, or this. It corresponds to this reaction, which is a half reaction. This is not a reaction which by itself you can run. We talked about this before. If you could run this reaction, and the products were stable, if you could run this reaction by itself, then you could collect a bunch of H plus AQs in a bottle, and you could collect a bottle of electrons. And then, as I told you, Horvath would open up his electron store and sell it by the bottle, and you go home and pour it into the socket and light up the television and all that stuff, and call up GRU and say, go to hell, don't need you anymore. Because you got your own electricity. But you can't do that, because you can't run a half reaction by itself. But now we got a reference point. Now also note that it also follows from this defined set of conditions for the thermodynamic reference point. In keeping with our recognition that to write H plus AQ is bad chemistry, even though textbooks do it. I mean, they take it for granted that now we know what we're talking about. Well, I don't like to do that in first year chemistry. We don't know yet what we're talking about. We have to learn this. You're more than capable of learning what's going on here. But we have to be sharp and clear in our communication. And the positive charge density of H plus is enormous. So if we have recognized along the way that metal lines with substantial positive charge density form well-defined hydrates, well, the positive charge density of H plus is far greater than any metal ion. So if these metal ions are going to form defined hydrates, so does H plus. And at the minimum, it's got to associate with one water molecule. Why not more? It's damn small. So we'll talk more about why not more, because there have been studies to try to adduce, elucidate the true nature of hydrated H+. Some have said it's two water molecules for H+. Some have said three, some have said four. I stick with one. And we'll talk about the reason for such, not today, but next time. So, take note that if the thermodynamic properties for this thing are zero, then adding H plus to this thing to create this thing, does that change the thermodynamic property values for this thing? Because I added something to this which has zero defined as all its thermodynamic properties. Right? That's what I had defined it. All the thermodynamic properties for this thing are zero. So if I add this thing with zero for its thermodynamic properties to this, am I going to change the thermodynamic property value for this? No. Which means the thermodynamic property values for this and this have got to be zero. I mean equal. Not zero, but equal. So the change in standard change in free energy for this thing is zero. Because I added this to this, that didn't change this at all. So when I add H plus to this, I don't change thermodynamic properties of this, but I create hydronium ion. So delta G is zero for this thing is zero. Which now tells you why, if you look in the table one, if you look at table one or any other data table, you'll see 
Del H sub F super zero, del G sub F super zero. S zero, hydronium ion, AQ, and water liquid are the same. Now then, application of this stuff. By running half reactions in conjunction with this half reaction, we can now evaluate thermodynamic properties for substances in solution, species in solution. This is a big part of electrochemistry, which is our next chapter. So right now, in addition to what we're doing, making this connection, we're also laying foundation for understanding what's going on in chapter 22 where we're going to be dealing extensively with half reactions. <laughs> Consider being assigned the task of determining the standard free energy of formation for hydroxide ion AQ. Well, by definition, delta G zero R for this half reaction is equal to delta G sub F super zero for hydroxide ion. Remember what the sub F means? How much of the stuff we're going to form? One mole. One mole. And we're going to form it from what? The required mole quantities of? The most stable allotropic forms of the component elements. You betcha. Well, under normal lab conditions, most stable allotropic form of elemental hydrogen is H2 gas and ox oxygen. O2 gas, so I need a half a mole of hydrogen gas reacting with a half a mole of oxygen gas, adding an electron, which shows you why this is a half a reaction, in the presence of water to make hydroxide ion AQ. So how do I get a number for delta G sub F super zero for hydroxide ion AQ? Well, let's take a look at a couple of reactions with which we are familiar, at least to some extent. At the minimum, we'll know they are reactions which can be run. Let's write down, this is reaction one. Hydrogen reacting with oxygen. Now, this shows hydrogen reacting with oxygen. But I expect you know that if I, in fact, react hydrogen with oxygen, will I get hydroxide ion AQ straight away? What will I get? Hydrogen reacting with, reacting with oxygen, what will I get? Water. So, this is a reaction which I can run, which has been run many times. And by making measurement of thermodynamic properties, I find that the change in standard free energy for this reaction is minus 237.1 kilojoules, making water liquid rather than water vapor, because we're doing this at 25 centigrade. All right, now let's try another reaction. What we're doing now is to consider a reaction which will allow us to recognize how this defined reference point can be related to this the reaction for which we are trying to evaluate delta G sub F super zero. This looks like a reaction with which you are familiar? What's this look like? Does it look like KW in the opposite direction? That's what it is. So, to get the change in standard free energy for this reaction, I will now give you the defined 
connection, not the defined connection, but the equation between this and this. I'll write it over here. I'm going to write down given. Now we can derive this relationship, which I'm just going to write on the board, from fundamental thermodynamic considerations. Some textbooks do it, some first year textbooks do it, but I want to bother with it. Because we're going to have to go through entropies of gases and a bunch of stuff that I simply don't want to bother with now. Because I think solution chemistry is more important than that stuff. So we're going to take this as a given. You likely have already noticed that this statement that I'm now going to write on the board is on the information sheet. Once again, it's not anything you have to derive or memorize. But you need to be able to use it. A change in standard free energy for any reaction is minus 2.3 RT log of the equilibrium constant. Or minus RT LNK if you pre prefer to work with natural logs. I prefer to work with log base 10 just because of all the pH stuff I do. What kind of value for R we want to use if we're going to use this relationship? Or let me say this, not what kind of value, but what kind of units do we want on R? Joules or kilojoules. And this again is given to you on the information sheet. I think on the information sheet, I just wrote 8.31. But the four sig figs is 8.314 joules per k-mole. Temperature is whatever temperature you're operating at. For our case here, it'll be 298K. Okay? Now then. Do we know K for this thing? What is K for this thing? For the conditions we are considering. K for this reaction is written. What is it? 1.0 times 10 to the 14 or minus 14? Isn't this KW? I think I said something wrong before. This is KW, it's not KW in reverse. Pardon me. If I say something dumb like that, holler. Throw rocks. Do something. Throw eggs. Let me know if you're going to throw eggs. I catch them. I like eggs. So. You now know this relationship, we're taking it as a given, and you know the value for the terms contained within that we have to use. R is this, and the most common unit attached to delta G or delta G zero is kilojoules. So you're going to have to make a joules to kilojoules conversion when you do the arithmetic, and here it's log of 1.0 times 10 to minus 14. What is the log of 1.0 times 10 to minus 14? Minus 14.00. Don't forget the sig figs. All right, so you can do the arithmetic if you wish. And then, three. What's the change in standard free energy for this reaction? Yeah. Zero, isn't it? Now then, let's put in four, our defined reference point, in reverse.
for which the change in standard free energy is defined as zero. Why did I write this reference point reaction in the opposite direction? What law am I following to do this arithmetic? Hess's, Hess's law. Because if you now take a look at one, two, three, four. As we have written them, and add them up, what do you get? And add one, two, three, four, what are you going to get? Hmm? Will this cancel with this? I'm missing something. Let me see here. Up. Oh! How'd this get in here? <laughs> All right. So a half a mole hydrogen gas product, one mole hydrogen gas reactant. How do those combine? This with this. What's that give me? Half hydrogen gas reactant. All right. So this is gone and this becomes a half. All right, nothing cancels the half mole of oxygen gas. And here's hydronium ion reactant, hydronium ion product. Here's water product. Water product, one mole, two moles, two moles, gone. So what's left? this. I add up the values and I've got it. This gives delta G sub F super zero for hydroxide ion AQ minus 157 0.3 kilojoules. I don't have to memorize it, that's not important. But what's important is to realize how we combine these half reactions by use of Hess's law to get the information in which we were interested. So we'll pick it up from this point next time.